I'm oh, sorry, I just did it. Sounds like that. Examples of the Eck reaction they can have are simple cyclizations with interesting oxidations they change in the catalyzed reaction. The reaction as recently catalyzed by the particles, a reaction as very open distributed, as we carried out with APROM molecularly with high energy reduction. And a reaction which is so widely used today that it sometimes gets triple usage and a total synthesis and it shows the molecules strictly. There is a cross coupling, there is a second cross coupling, CN, CN, and there are three heck reactions in the construction of this model. The reaction was summarized by Richard Heck in volume 27 of Organic Reactions. At that time, he stated, at that time, he stated in the introduction, the flame catalyzed violation of organic halides provides a very convenient method for forming carbon carbon bonds at unsubstituted minority positions. That was the beginning. At that time, the reaction was described in about 45 pages in organic reactions, which 75 references, 22 pages of tabular data. The most recent review on the Heck reaction is the intramolecular version <coughs> of the It has 377 pages and about a order of magnitude higher number of references. The reaction is seen in all books in the last issue of the latest book called Strategic Applications of Main Reactions by Kurki and Zako. The reaction is described and it shows again <coughs> the most powerful example. Here is the 
Seminal publication in 19. Cannot be right. 72. Oh, sorry. This is the sem not the seminal <coughs> publication. This is his PhD work, the solving style, where he achieved a physical organic training background. And this is the seminal paper, 72, which set us on the road of transition metal catalyzed chemistry at the building in 72. And notice. The first sentence, Mizoroki and co workers have recently reported a flea catalyzed aerolation, giving credit to the fact that Mizoroki was the first to publish this, and then saying independently the discovery of this reaction under milder conditions. That was the beginning of the reaction. And I'd like to point out two other contributions, about many, by Professor Heck that stand out in my view. One is a 75 paper, Journal of Organic Chemistry, which, if you don't read it fully, you will not recognize details. The Suzuki reaction was described for the first time. A vinyl boronic acid coupling reaction was carried out four years before publication of Suzuki in Europe. And then the second contribution, which is Journal of Organic Metallic Chemistry, details you can read in the brochure. There is a reaction which is effectively the Sonogashira coupling reaction uh, without copper. Sonogashira introduced copper in this reaction, which now bears its name. A special issue is dedicated to Richard Heck coming out in November. In Simlac, in this issue, you will see contributions for many chemists who are in the area of cross coupling and transition metal catalyzed reactions. And the issue from us here, if you'd like an extra copy, sometime after November. So, Richard Heck is, is with us still. There we go. Hopefully, some more cobalt chemistry. And 25 years of the Heck reaction or more have indicated the extent to which the contributions of Professor Heck stand today. And we are very, very fortunate to have him with us. To talk about the origins of the Heck reaction. How about the end? Professor. when I finished my graduate school and postdoctoral training and I went to work in 
thousand chemical engineers and chemical researchers who were working on developing a process for producing polyethylene and polypropylene using the recently discovered singular anoxic catalyst. So I had been involved in this for about two years. In that uh, time, I did nothing that very much scientific interest, but it got me started in working with transition methods. So I'm going to talk about these early days of, of transition metal organic chemistry. This time there was very little known about the mechanisms of any of this reaction. And I've been trained with Winstein in mechanistic organic chemistry, so I thought this was a good opportunity for me to get into understanding better the early transition metal. ever did. He just made these compounds. He characterized them much to his credit because this was pretty early in, this was in the early 50s. So he had to do this all on his own. This was a new kind of technique to work with these compounds. But he never did anything else with them. But I saw his compounds and I thought he did sweet intermediates <laughs> Step I proposed was a hydride addition. 
addition to the alkene, based on these boron and aluminum examples, and it turns out the global hydrocarbonyl does add very rapidly to alkenes even at zero degrees. In the absence of air, of course, all this has to be done in the absence of oxygen. And it gives a mixture of uh, alkyls, the straight chain one, which I've shown here, and it also gives the branch chain one with, with an alpha methyl here. You get a mixture of the two of uh, 70, 30, something like that, depends on the particular olefin you're using. But uh, you do get these organo cobalt compounds. It's uh, analogous to what people had made the methyl compound. Now, uh, I'm only showing one isomer here. I wanted to keep the slide from being too complicated. But looking at only the uh, straight chain isomer. This compound reacts with carbon oxide to get the ACO cobalt tetracarbonyl. And it apparently goes by way of an ACO cobalt tricarbonyl. This is a 16 electron compound. Well, the alkyl tetracarbonyl is an 18 electron compound. This is a stable form. <coughs> it seems to be an equilibrium with a very low concentration of the 16 electron species, which is the reactive. In this form, it will react with carbon oxide to give the NCL uh, cobalt tetracarbonyl, which is more, much more stable than the alkyl, but still very air sensitive and it still decomposes well below zero. So these compounds are quite difficult to work with, but uh, at least we were able to show by <coughs> spectral analysis and by isolation of phosphine derivatives of these things, what they were. Cobalt compounds react with trivalent phosphate to give a ACL cobalt trivalent phosphate derivative, which you can isolate at room temperature, but it's still very air sensitive. The uh, mechanism of the reaction then uh, was fairly clear. At least the first two steps we were able to demonstrate this way. The uh, final step was a reduction of this ACL cobalt tetra which can occur with hydrogen or with cobalt hydrocarbonyl. The hydrogen uh, reduction requires at least 500 pounds pressure or more, while the cobalt hydrocarbonyl reduction occurs at uh, even zero degrees very rapidly. And it appears from kinetic studies done under the catalytic hydroformylation conditions that it's probably cobalt hydrocarbonyl that's actually on the conditions. So this was the mechanism that we came up with for the hydroformylation. This was the first mechanism of any transition <coughs> catalyzed reaction to be established with experimental evidence. And it's been stood the test of time now. It's been around for 40 or so years. People have been trying to disprove it, but so far haven't succeeded. So on the basis of this, we did a lot of chemistry with
uncoupling here, though it's not uh, visible because of traces of cobalt two in there, and cobalt two is paramagnetic, messed up the uh, NMR somewhat. Still, was good enough so we can see that the protons were in the ratio of two to one, suggestive of this pi-alum structure. And we propose this as the first first pi-alum. chemistry, but uh, I'm not going to dwell on that today because we have more interesting things to do with that. Yes. Uh, I wanted to mention what I <coughs> do here with cobalt chemistry uh, since I returned here to my work. We wanted to see if we couldn't do this cobalt chemistry without getting carbon monoxide insertion, because we always get carbon monoxide insertion with simple alkyl cobalt compounds. So what we had to do was to try to get rid of the coordinated carbon monoxide and see if we could get the same chemistry to occur without the seal insertion. So we then tried to do that by replacing these coordinated carbon monoxides. If you add things like triphenylphosphine, you can replace one Move the other one over, and you get the alkyl, the acyl cobalt, tricarbonyl phosphate. But you can't replace more than one phosphate with tricarbonyl phosphate. But if you use trimethyl phosphate or a better trimethyl propane phosphate, which is this cup down here, this gives you higher melting, less soluble compounds than trimethyl phosphate. So the, the, this uh, trimethyl propane phosphate first replaces one by CO over, then we'll replace the second one by uh, evolution of CO, and you can get this, this trimethyl low propane phosphate acid compound. Now, to get more replaced, it won't replace more than two directly, but you can do it indirectly. If you take this um, acyl compound, it'll react with sodium methoxide, and you can uh, make methyl acetate and sodium salt of the dicarbonyl. Now, Yeah. 
geo insertion. So we were not successful so far in getting that reaction to occur without inserting that carbon monoxide. So we had to go on and do other chemistry after Dr. Kelly's so too interested in the cobalt chemistry that I was doing. So what uh, I did was to do some plated chemistry. And what gave me the idea to do this was to work with Pat Henry, who was in the same laboratory with me across the hall. He had been studying the mechanism of this uh, commercially important then, and still is, the lacquer oxidation of ethylene to acetaldehyde. It's uh, a very important commercial reaction, and he studied the kinetics of it and came up with this mechanism. This was all his work. He had nothing to do with it. But I put it up here just to show what gave me the idea to do some other chemistry. This is uh, published and uh, uh, this is all academics work. He, he proposed this species here as an intermediate in the marker oxidation, a hydroxy ethyl palladium chloride complex, basically with the chloride and water product to uh, complete the coordination.
this dignified that we could be apprehended halides this way. Like the analogous to the Grignard reaction. Since the blade of metal, not facet metal, but finally divided to a new metal, and it would react with iota benzene in the presence of an alkene and do this reaction.
this then is turned out to be our next system. Other since you can do a lot of elimination and get the uh, email here. It's still a useful variation. Now you can also do this reaction internally and get cyclic compounds. We did
qualitative tool in this chemistry. But it occurs to us is that this reaction is giving a reduction of the central double bond without the bromic acid. You get the octatrons. So we probably took it as a single dose we could reduce. And it turns out that it's a very good reduce. It's anything you can reduce with hydrogen under low pressure. Um, for example, bromonitrobenzene with plasma or plenty of carbon, you can reduce the bromine selectively. But of course, with, with that catalyst and the usual hydrogenation procedure, you've got to get the hydrogen out of there right away in order to reduce the nitro group as well. With the formic acid, it turns out all of the formic acid is used for reducing that. Saturated carbonyl compounds are reduced by this system selectively. The alpha beta reduction first. And you can reduce acetylene, so it's a nice way to reduce acetylene. So you don't have to worry about over reduction. I think that's how you do with hydrogen. And you don't have to use it. Poison catalyst, you can use some of but plenty of my heart, then you get only a reduction in the cis out. The yield is not so high here. The problem is this product is alkalizing quite readily when you turn the purify. The reduction is totally cis. Thank you. 
a picture of Wilkinson in there. Where are they? Right there. <laughs> and finally, the second conference in China, in Shanghai, There's, uh, again, Kutsui in the middle there, and, uh, well, some of the other people that maybe would recognize two of these people. Anyway. Regarding your research work recently, you use the atomic acid and the triazol mean yeah. as a counter hydrogenation agent. So, is this uh, something possible to use like uh, isopropanol? Mm -hmm. Because it's another source for the counter hydrogenation. Another solvent? Uh, isopropanol. Isopropanol? Isopropanol. The solvent uh, For the counter hydrogenation. Because you use a formic acid and try to try yeah, it on Yeah, transfer hydrogen. Oh, no. so the suggestion is to use that yeah. solvent. Yeah, yeah, to use the hydrogen. It doesn't work. You need to use acid. The only thing that doesn't work. It works. Other people have used other bases and other solids. They sort of acetate and use other means uh, uh, and so on. But the formic acid. It's clear that the lecture was so so clear. That, uh, <laughs> but I think uh, Richard had showed us the clarity with which.
technology attack these problems initially. The rationality and the mechanistic insight that led him to make these discoveries. And he mentioned only a few of them as he said along the way. So we are privy here to a historic lecture by Richard Heck. Um, I think Greek taught us some chemistry, these those of us who are not slowly, deliberately, progress in research. Rapidity of things, how things move. So what else do I have except to thank you very much for giving us this lecture and being with us for this time period.